Namo Atasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Namo Atasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Namo Atasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambutasa Bhutang Dhammang Sankang Namasami I wonder if people would mind coming a little bit closer, kind of. So during this time, all around the world actually, in this monastery and in the whole Buddhist world, people are coming together to commemorate the Buddha. In Thailand, Visakha Puja is known as Buddha Day. And uh, so it's the day where legend tells us the Buddha was born, he attained enlightenment, and also entered Mahaparinibbana on the full moon of the sixth month. So I'm just going to test people's uh, uh, knowledge of the Buddha's, the Buddhist. Uh, Biography is the legend. Uh, where was the Buddha born? Anybody know? Lumbini, that's right. Which country is that? Modern day? Nepal, that's right. And <laughs> how long ago was that? How many years ago? I want a question, an answer from this side. <laughs> how many? Very good. 2,552 years ago, so the Buddha wasn't born as the Buddha, the Buddha was born as a Bodhisattva. So, what was his name? What was the name of the clan that the Buddha was born in? Sakya, that's right, okay. Family name? Gotama, that's right. And his first name? Very good. <laughs> Siddhartha Gotama of the Sakyan clan was born in uh, what is now known as Lumbini. And uh, he was a very special being. So, uh, anyone have any ideas about what is a Bodhisattva? That's an interesting question. What is a Bodhisattva? being destined for enlightenment and being destined for Buddhahood. So that process, that has, a, that has a conditioned, that has a causality, doesn't it? That has some conditions. So what would make a being destined for Buddhahood? Any ideas? Sorry? Huh? Vows, and but what do the vows entail? If you after you vow, what do you have to do? To develop uh, particularly virtuous qualities. How long for? Any ideas? A very very long time. <laughs> so. I just mentioned this because before, when you look at the the legend, which I I said I can't, I have faith. That there's a lot of truth uh, to the story of uh, Siddhartha's life and his process before he became a Buddha. When you look at that, the details of that life story, you realise that this is a very remarkable uh, person. The being that realises not being or not self is actually a very special special being. So he's cultivated uh, very potent spiritual qualities. There are ten, ten Bharamis. I'm not going to talk so much about the Bharamis and the cultivation of the Bharamis, but I just wanted to acknowledge that, uh, that the Bodhisattva, born as Siddhartha Gautama, was a very special being, a being with a lot of uh, accumulated virtue, talents, and special qualities. And these did not come about without a cause. They came about because of uh, an incredible amount of effort, 
an incredible amount of sincerity, great devotion, determination, focus, discipline. Um, so this is why, at uh, another question, how old was Siddhartha Gautama when he decided to leave his princely life? 29, that's right. So this is why at the age of 29, uh, a young man who was born as a prince, who was very talented and very well loved and very popular, decided to leave it all behind. He had uh, what they call a Mahakaruna, great compassion, a mind which was quivering with compassion for the sake of all beings. So this was what was weighing on the Buddha's mind, on the, on the Bodhisattva's mind, when he was 29, when he left his uh, beautiful wife and newborn son. He was looking at the, the son and the, the wife and he was thinking, these people who I love and care for are subject to old age, sickness and death. And I too am subject to old age, sickness and death. And so with a heart quivering with compassion and great determination, he thought, I want to find a path beyond this. And so he left in the middle of the night and he began his uh, period of striving. So this is when we see his remarkable qualities. That renunciation is in itself remarkable. And then when he met his first teachers, he was a very, very gifted meditator. His first teachers taught him Arupa Jhanas probably Rupa Jhanas before that, but the Arupa Jhanas are extremely subtle, refined, powerful states of concentration. So his first teacher taught him, I think it was the seventh jhana, the base of nothingness, which is a, a very profound realization in itself. He, but he realized the limitations of that. When he came out of this very refined uh, concentration state, which was no doubt incredibly blissful, he realized that he was still subject to old age, sickness and death. So he went and found another teacher. And that teacher taught him the next level, which was the base of, base of neither perception or non-perception. And what we're talking about here is quite is unimaginable for ordinary beings, but it's basically the most subtle, the most refined, even the most pure form of concentration that there is. So he developed that and he had enough mindfulness and enough wisdom and enough insight to realize I'm still subject to old age, sickness and death. So he was looking then for an answer beyond this uh, problem, the samsaric predicament. So then he was practicing austerities, extreme austerities for uh, I think five or six years. During this time, it was said he ate one rice grain a day, that his skin his uh, skin touched the front of his backbone and the skin at the back touched the back of the backbone. During that time, it's, uh, it's important to understand that he wasn't allowing his mind to unify into jhana. What he was exploring at that time was the extremity of painful feelings with an attitude of patient endurance. And he did it for five years or six years, a very long time. And he makes a statement, whatever ascetic there has been who has practiced austerities and felt painful, racking, piercing sensations, he said, there may be beings who have done it to this extent, but there are no beings who have done it, who have explored this more. So he took that to its absolute extreme and he had the same insight. So this doesn't lead to cessation of rebirth. This doesn't lead to cessation of suffering. He's, he was still subject to old age, sickness and death and rebirth. So then he had the insight that about the middle way. The middle way was uh, he remembered that he once had a blissful state of concentration under the, is it the rose apple tree, I believe, as a young boy as the prince, and he remembered that that was a harmless form of pleasure, and he had the insight that that kind of concentration combined with skillful contemplation may actually be something which works. So then he went for a walk, he had a bath, and uh, Sujata, uh, Sujata the milk 
maid offered him some uh, sweet rice milk, legend tells us. And so he ate some uh, sweet rice and then he went and he sat under the Bodhi tree. And so he did, after all of this striving, having cultivated the most refined states of concentration, having uh, cultivated the most uh, profound patience, he then applied his mind with discrimination to this concentration combined with contemplation and he had liberating insight. So he was uh, contemplating his past lives. The, the biography tells us under the Bodhi tree he was contemplating five, ten, twenty, fifty, a hundred, five hundred past lives. And so through that it would seem the main uh, insight that he's having is impermanence. He was saying, here I was born as this type of being, I live this type of life and then psh, passed away. Reborn in another uh, existence, lived, passed away, born, lived, died, born, lived, died, born, lived, died, on and on and on and on. And then uh, we understand that he was contemplating, once he was seeing the impermanence of this uh, thing that we call a self, for a period of time we think we're a being with particular preferences and then that ends and then born somewhere else, different preferences, different, uh, pr possibly different character traits, culturally conditioned, be born in very different situations, heaven realms, hell realms, animal realms, ghost realms, if you believe in Buddhist cosmology, and, and I do. So he saw uh, the impermanence of it all, the, the constant state of flux, the undependability. And then he began to investigate what then is the cause of this aging and this death. And he realized that the cause of aging and death was a birth. So then he was investigating, well, what is the cause of birth? And then he had his insights into uh, ignorance and delusion and craving being the things which uh, thrust a being into another birth. So then he had his uh, profound liberating insights into not-self. And then he, in the third watch of the night, it said that he was contemplating the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, this middle way. So then we have the enlightened Buddha, which we commemorate on Visakha Puja Day. One thing I wanted to talk about tonight uh, was faith. Because, interestingly enough, in the seven weeks after the Buddha's enlightenment, he was uh, exploring different contemplations. And one of the things he did, I believe, under the Negroda Bunyan tree, was contemplate the five spiritual faculties, or the five spiritual qualities. Uh, it's always nice to have a bit of involvement. I've been talking for a while. Does anyone know what the five spiritual faculties are? I bet the monks do. D do you know five spiritual faculties? I gave you a hint already. Something that I said I wanted to talk about. Faith, very good. First one. Anyone else? Hmm? Very good. Yep, that's one of them. Wisdom, yep. Hmm? Yeah, that's right. So he went and he was uh, sitting under the Negroda Bunyan tree and he contemplated for a week. And this is a very important hint for us that the newly enlightened Buddha contemplated for a week, five qualities. In Pali, Sattā, Virya, Sati, Samādhi, Panya. Faith, effort, mindfulness, concentration and wisdom. And he said, these spiritual qualities, when cultivated, merge in the deathless. So I love this list because it's a very pithy, it's a very short. And you can understand that if you cultivate just these five qualities properly, it's going to merge in the deathless, which Arjun Sumedha is always talking about. The reason I wanted to talk about faith is, uh, I, my personal feeling is that virya, the second effort, energy uh, factor, 
many of us have some faith in the Buddha and many of us would like to put more effort into our practice. But many of us also, for some reason, can't quite put as much effort into it as we would like to. And one thing that I would suggest as a possible reason is because of lack of faith. So if our faith is somewhat heady, cerebral, intellectual, a bit vague, that won't necessarily translate as energy or resolution. So as Westerners, I spent more than 10 years in Thailand and I, was, I grew up in Australia. So I think I have some understanding of differences between uh, traditional Asian people, Buddhists, and then Western Buddhists, because I came from the usual kind of uh, heady, a bit cynical um, Western experience, and then was immersed in a very traditional conservative Asian experience. Thai people, Thai Buddhists, have a lot of faith. And it's not a heady uh, quality in Thai people. It's a very heart-based quality. And so this is what I think makes it possible if you have a heart-based quality of faith. It becomes possible to have uh, energy. Where are Because effort, it has to come from here, doesn't it? It has to come from your heart. You know, you have to really see the value of something to put forth effort. So if we haven't uh, brought our faith deeply into our heart, it might not translate as that effort that we wish we could make. So this is why I wanted to talk about the Buddha as the Bodhisattva first, because if we understand the supreme effort of this being, we can give rise to feelings like gratitude, which is a very wholesome, it's very close to mudita, that Brahma Vihara appreciation. If you open your heart with gratitude and appreciation to that being. So this is before we try to contemplate not-self, before we try to let go into emptiness and uh, the deathless. Because let's face it, most of the time when we come and sit down, there, there is a being. We perceive a being to be sitting on the cushion. So, okay, if we're, we think we're a being, we then can think about the most superior being in, being in samsara, which is the Buddha. So it's a way of uh, going from where we are and leading ourselves onwards to, to a contemplation which is gladdening, brightening, uplifting for the mind. So me, Ajahn Natsalo, as a deluded being, thinking of the Buddha, an enlightened being, with gratitude. Something happens in that contemplation. If I really have uh, gratitude for the Buddha, if I really have appreciation for what he accomplished and for what he realized and for what he's teaching, Something happens in my mind. It becomes brighter, it becomes lighter. And because the object of contemplation is so pure, a Buddha, that my own sense of self gets less kind of contracted, less coarse, becomes more wholesome. So this is one of the anusatis, one of the contemplations that the Buddha actually encouraged was contemplation of the Buddha. So we can contemplate what he did, what he accomplished, and then his remarkable qualities. One of the things I like to notice in the suttas occasionally is the Buddha would uh, scan the world before going out on arms round. And occasionally he would discover that 20 miles away there was one being who was ripe for teaching and for liberation. So he would go for arms and he would eat his meal, and then he would walk to find that one being. So this is a, the Buddha can seem very lofty, you read some of the suttas, he can seem quite stern, quite fierce, quite impersonal. But then contemplate this, that the Buddha was willing to walk 20 miles to teach one being. And often those beings were liberated through that, through that effort. So I like to contemplate his compassion, his humanity, his kindness. The Buddha would walk to teach one being. On his deathbed, on the occasion of the Mahaparinibbana, once again, one wanderer had walked a long way, he wanted to meet the Buddha, had a question to ask. All of the Buddha's chief attendants in the front row, the, the sky full of devas. Um, I think someone was saying to the 
to the wanderer, no, 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 he's dying. It's a really inconvenient time. The Buddha said, no, wait. If somebody has a question to ask the Tathagata, let that person ask that question now. And so this wandering ascetic had this chance to ask this question of the Buddha as he was leaving his body. And uh, so I like to contemplate that kind of extraordinary, beautiful, uh, human kind of kindness, the compassion of the Buddha, and a kind of rejoice. Well, how wonderful that there was a being who was uh, that profound, that powerful, that amazing, that pure, and yet so kind and humble. So those kind of com contemplations can be very brightening, very uplifting. So, faith. Faith in the Buddha, faith in his goodness. It's okay to actually sit. We all uh, are afflicted with a thinking mind quite often. We come to sit, we want to watch the breath, or we want to listen to the sound of silence, or we want to identify with the deathless, and we find that the mind is thinking. So if that's the case, you can decide to think skillfully upon one of the subjects that the Buddha recommended contemplating. So we can think in ways in our meditation, you know, just for example, you can decide to contemplate for the first 10 minutes the qualities of a Buddha. And then, if you, hopefully your mind becomes brighter and happier and a little more still, then you can turn to uh, a more subtle contemplation. For people who have it within their means, I would uh, strongly recommend visiting Bodh Gaya in India in the months of December, January or February because this is the peak pilgrimage season in India. And sometimes, if we haven't seen people who embody uh, faith in a very deep, kind of cellular way, we might not really understand what it, what it looks like, what it feels like, what it smells like, you know. If you, you know, we are human beings, we, are, we need to be we are social creatures, we need to be conditioned in, in certain ways to understand things. So, when you go to Bodh Gaya, you can see uh, thousands, tens of thousands of people coming with a mind of faith to pay respects to where the Buddha became enlightened. And it's a very amazing experience. I've had the good fortune to spend, um, actually I was there for a month in February, just this past February, and I arrived at the time that they call the Nyingma Monlam Chenmo, which is a Tibetan uh, I think New Year celebration. The Nyingma is one of the sects in the Tibetan uh, order. What that meant was that every uh, Tibetan practitioner in Ladakh and Bhutan and Nepal and India who could get there came. So there were about 10,000 of them. And they were converging on the Bodhi tree and the Chedi to do their all day puja. And so to sit underneath the Bodhi tree, with 7,000 monks and nuns chanting facing the Bodhi tree and many, many hundreds circumambulating all day, that's a kind of experience where you get a sense of, oh, there's a lot of energy here. He says there's a lot of faith. <laughs> and so you see, you can see things which you might not see in uh, Britain very often. People bowing, full-length prostrations all day. You say, well, what kind of quality would make that possible? Well, you'd have to have a lot of faith, wouldn't you? And I personally met a monk uh, from Ladakh who did 3,000 bows a day, every day, for a month. And he, did, he had done that every year for 10 years. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried these Tibetan prostrations, but uh, if you're not fit and if you haven't cultivated them, doing more than 10 is difficult. <laughs> So 3,000 a day is a lot, but he's, you know, he's, uh, I guess, the peak. He's my kind of uh, teacher for um, expressing faith and determination and effort. He's someone who I met who really, yeah, I was impressed. And it's good. It's good to meet these people because it helps you get a sense for, well, where's my faith? Where's my kind of effort? And it's like, well, I actually met a human being who has this much faith and this much effort and this much happiness. This was a happy person, by the way. He wasn't miserable. He was a very, <laughs> very radiant, happy person to be expressing his faith in this way. I thought it was very interesting. He was an interesting contemplation. He was a monk, so I guess that's contemplation on Sangha. Here is somebody uh, making a full-time commitment to expressing 
their faith and gratitude and respect uh, by bowing at the Bodhi tree all day for a month every year. So just say, if you have it within your means, if you're really interested in generating uh, faith, it might be worth doing something like that. Pilgrimage, spending some time, if you, if you have the money, get on a plane, go to India, and just kind of soak up that energy. Another truly wonderful place to go, which our tradition has very close links with, of course, is Northeast Thailand. And uh, if you go to Northeast Thailand during the time of the Ajahn Chah Memorial Week in January, and you hear maybe 1,000 monks and nuns and 10,000 lay people chant the evening chanting. What's that like? And we, actually I'm, I'm not going to criticize our chanting, I think it's quite beautiful, but everyone's very mindful to be harmonious and quite careful. Everybody's careful and uh, nobody wants there to be any dissonance. And, uh, but when you go to Northeast Thailand, people will chant with all of their heart. So it's like, oh well, what would that be like? What would it be like to chant with all of your heart, the evening chanting? And sometimes it's not that beautiful to listen to. These are seventy-year-old village women whose ears are failing <laughs> in large numbers. But there's a certain uh, there's a certain quality when they chant. It just strikes you in the heart. It's like, wow, these people really have deep heart-based faith. When they recollect the Buddha, they do it with their heart, with all of their heart. And it's very beautiful, it's very touching. So it's good to witness those things, experience those things in a way so that one can absorb through the pores of your skin and into your mind that feeling of what it's like to have a heart-based faith. And, uh, but if you don't have it within your means to fly to India or to go to Thailand, you know, you can contemplate, you can ask yourself, you know, what can I do to generate more faith? What can I do as a devotional practice? Understanding that you want to balance these faculties. But it's interesting that faith comes first. Sata, virya, sati, samadhi, panya, sata comes first. As I said, because I think that when you really have faith, then you can put forth some effort. A lot of effort. So, of course, you need to do it with mindfulness and, and wisdom. But, uh, so you can ask yourself, what can I do? Uh, hopefully contemplating the Buddha and his qualities would be helpful. If you could read the biography and just meditate upon a being who has boundless, unobstructed, impartial compassion for all beings without exception. So that's not such a, a, a difficult thing to, you know, just pick that up as a con contemplation. There was this one being who existed, the Buddha, he had boundless, unobstructed compassion for all beings without exception. And just contemplate that. Because basically the response in the mind is, wow, that's amazing. Or loving kindness, a being who had boundless friendliness, goodwill towards every being. So that means, uh, you know, Mao Zedong, Stalin, Hitler, our friends who are probably in the lower realms now, he had goodwill, unshakable feelings of kindness towards those beings. That's amazing. Understanding, of course, that those beings acted unskillfully, affected by delusion, and then have to reap the results of that with a lot of pain and suffering. So he has kindness for them. He doesn't see them as solid, bad beings. He sees them as, as beings who actually have the potential to be Buddhas themselves if they cultivate that. So, you know, over a very long time. So you can ask yourself in your practice, how can I deepen my faith? Sometimes expressing faith is just a good way to make karma with this condition. So you ask yourself, how can I contemplate in ways which give rise to faith? And what can I do in my practice to uh, express that faith. So that might be offering flowers at a shrine at home. You know, go and get some beautiful flowers that you think are a worthy offering to the Buddha. You could do that once a week. It's a very traditional practice in Asia. Lights, candles, 
your favorite type of incense. And uh, we use Buddha images. We, it's not the image that you're being devoted to, but you're using it as a tool. So you can get yourself a nice Buddha image and you can, okay, may this image serve as, my, as a tool to help me to generate faith, express gratitude and appreciation. And so you ask yourself, okay, well, what fragrance do I think is the most beautiful fragrance that I'd like to offer to the Buddha in appreciation and gratitude? And so then you offer that. Well, what flower do you think is the most beautiful kind of flower that you could offer the Buddha? And you offer that. When you kind of, you know, you do something and you make an offering, it makes karma, it establishes a, a kind of a habit of expressing faith and devotion. Chanting, traditional way to express respect, gratitude, faith. So kind of uh, look at the chanting and decide well, which one do you like most? Which chant do you find most enjoyable? Which one touches you most deeply? And you can decide, and most Westerners don't have much of a sense for this, most modern people, but in Asia, um, if people like a chant, in Thailand many monks will do the one chant nine times. So Thai people like the number nine. So if it's ITP So, the Purita recollecting the three refuges, they'll chant it nine times. Uh, Tibetan tradition, of course, taking it to the extremes, they might chant it a hundred thousand times. So it's just good to know that that's possible. Which is the chant that you really love? You can do that as a meditation. Okay, I'm going to chant the Metta Sutta. Maybe you don't want. Maybe you can't do nine straight away. It might get a bit tedious or something. But you can do it three times. Whatever your favorite chant is, like really, you might do it at home where nobody's looking. You don't have to feel too self-conscious. <laughs> okay, what chant do I? People tell me that British people are self-conscious and shy. So, so go to somewhere quiet where you don't think uh, people are watching. <laughs> where you don't have to be frightened, and then chant your favorite chant with all of your heart as many times as you want to, just brightening the mind, gladdening the mind, bringing that faith into the heart. And, uh, and hopefully that will translate as, a, as a being able to put forth more effort. In the times where you find there just isn't the energy and you can't put forth the effort that you'd really like to do, you might want to look at this. Uh, okay, well, what can I do to lift my faith? And uh, very important to understand with faith that it's not just faith in the Buddha and his enlightenment, which is important. It's faith in your own potential to become enlightened. So many people have an obstruction here because of internalized self-aversion. So many of us have this, a kind of a rejection of ourselves, a rejection of our potential or a denial in a way. And so it's important to understand that the Buddha uh, explained that all beings have the potential to liberate themselves. So that means you too. Even if you don't believe it. Uh, if you don't believe it, you're wrong. Because the Buddha said you could. <laughs> so identify this. Ask yourself, do I really have faith that I have the potential to be enlightened? And if you don't, you have some work to do. You have to affirm this. You do have the potential to become enlightened. One thing, uh, we can get frustrated because we have a kind of a postmodern attention span and we're a bit impatient. So we might do a few retreats and we might practice really hard for a few weeks and we realize, well, I'm not enlightened yet. And we can get disheartened. But uh, the process of becoming enlightened usually, as my teachers in Thailand have explained, does take a few lifetimes. One thing that uh, one of my teachers, Arjuna Nun in Thailand, uh, says, which I found helpful, is that however much effort you can make this lifetime does translate literally as less uh, lifetimes, less rebirths. So it's good to challenge this kind of, th we have this sense of frustration, this sense of disappointment, I've been practicing really hard and I can't see any uh, dramatic results. I'm not enlightened yet, I'm not even half enlightened yet. This This can be disappointing, this can be frustrating. So I thought this was a skillful uh, contemplation. However much effort I make now translates as less experience of birth, aging, sickness and death. Less lifetimes. It does bring you closer to this goal of liberation. So you can affirm that. It's like practice. Your refuge in Dhamma this is. Dhamma is the path to liberation. Your refuge in the Dhamma, your refuge in this path of practice. However much practice you can do now brings you closer and closer to the goal, even if you can't see the results. 
So very important to contemplate that, that uh, your practice is valuable, your practice is worthwhile, and uh, your practice is precious. It's a gift to you, and it's a gift to your future lives. However much practice you can do now, you have less and less suffering, create more and more auspicious karma, have more and more auspicious influences uh, ripening in the future, more and more supportive circumstances. You know, I've been talking for a while now, and so perhaps that's enough. Um, I offer this reflection for your contemplation. I hope that some of what I've offered has been helpful to some of you. If people want to go, you can go now. I always like to give people the opportunity to ask questions if anybody does want to ask a question. Any questions? No? No, I, under, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, no, I think truthfulness would lead to faith in the Buddha myself. A, a truthful uh, investigation of life and uh, investigation of conditions. So you may not have that faith yet, I do. I believe my faith is based upon skillful contemplation and investigation. I myself uh, believe I've met beings who have realized the truth that the Buddha taught. So I met them myself. Um, so these are people who I believe have uprooted greed, hatred and delusion from their minds. These people occasionally talk about their past lives from their personal experience. This is one on one, not to impress anybody. And uh, so I've been deeply affected by that. I have uh, great faith in these people. These are some of them disciples of Ajahn Chah. So Faith should be a result of uh, investigation, but I would be one thing I would offer to you as a as a contemplation is not to have faith in doubt actually, because sometimes we do. Faith is actually a, a faculty that we all have. It's functioning as human beings. You have faith in something, and it, when you have faith in something, you grasp it. Many Westerners have faith in doubt, so I would rather hold on to my uh, my doubt my uh, cynicism which I think is a realistic uh, look at life and that actually there's a view there there's a view so um, anyway I would encourage you to meditate a lot and bring this uh, as far as there not being evidence for rebirth actually more and more studies by doctors by psychologists are uh, in books now of, of psychologists who went with impartial witnesses and doctors who, who met children who recollected their past lives and they went to those villages and the, those children were able to say this was my mother, this was my father, that was their name and the mother and the father were able to verify, yeah that's true. Uh, I can't remember, there are books now with uh, clinical studies sponsored by major universities where doctors, not Buddhist monks, have uh, investigated these things more and more evidence for people who, who want to have evidence that, that might be a helpful uh, thing to uh, read if that, if that helps you to open your, your heart to the possibility of rebirth and karma
for me it makes sense on another level as well. If you just look at the diversity of qualities in beings and the diversity of uh, opportunity that beings have, for me, okay, well this must have a condition, that's my, my feeling for this, and karma explains that to a fairly good extent, why beings would have different opportunities, different faculties, different qualities, that uh, basically it's a cause of things that they did or didn't do in the past. But in Buddhism, and approaching Buddhist practice, nobody has to believe, it's your choice. It's your choice. And uh, take on these beliefs if they're helpful. One thing, the Eightfold Path is sometimes explained as a right view, right intention, etc., etc. Another thing is it can be translated as skillful view. So the Buddha himself said that to believe in karma and rebirth was skillful in as much as even if it wasn't true, which he said it was, it leads you to live a, a good life, a life which is of benefit to you and to others. So sometimes we can take these things on just as being skillful, something skillful. But it's your choice. <laughs>